Hello, I'm Jim Ryan, President and CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment. I'm honored to be here today to introduce you to three key leaders at SIE who will discuss PlayStation's focus and business strategy for FY23. Lin Tao, our Head of Finance and Corporate Strategy. Eric Lampel, who oversees marketing and global sales and business operations. And Herman Hulst, the Head of PlayStation Studios. Thank you for your valuable time today. Thank you for the introduction, Jim. I'm Eric Lempel, Senior Vice President, Global Marketing, Sales, and Business Operations, and I'm delighted to be here today sharing exciting progress in the games and network services business. Today, we are going to walk you through the foundations we have established for growth across three areas, console growth, portfolio expansion, and Sony Group collaboration. PS5 is the strongest platform we have ever built. Our first party software has become even more successful as we deliver on IP expansion opportunities. And we are now seeing collaboration across Sony Group starting to deliver even more meaningful benefits to multiple parts of the business. In FY22, we achieved record high revenue and sold 19.1 million PS5s, showing continued strong momentum now that supply constraints have eased. We now have a PS5 install base of 38.4 million. PS5 is now in free supply and is driving impressive user engagement. We also had strong results in profitability, despite the unfavorable exchange rates and increasing investment in both platform and content, including the acquisition of Bungie. We believe this presentation will illustrate the best way to take advantage of our current momentum and set ourselves up for future growth. The first element we will discuss is the strength of the PS5 console. We have never been in a better position with our core device. Demand for PS5 and engagement are both high, and we have great content and brand strength. After a challenging situation, we are now in free supply and finally able to provide consumers with the PS5 they have been waiting for. 12 months ago, Jim promised that FY23 would be the year PS5 would overtake the PS4 installed base at the equivalent point in the life cycle. We expect PS5 to surpass the PS4 install base in Q3 globally. We have actually already achieved this in several markets, including Japan. Supply constraints have been challenging, and the teams have worked to ensure more agility through mitigation measures, including sourcing multiple suppliers and logistical negotiations for optimal delivery routes. Eclipsing PS4 sales will mark a significant milestone in what we expect to be our most successful and profitable console generation ever. Having ample supply of PS5 consoles has made all the difference. Here you can see the comparison between PS5 factory shipments last year and this year. Our teams worked hard to keep up the momentum while we were supply constrained, and when we were able to meet the demand, we reinvigorated efforts to reach players waiting to find a PS5 in stock. We are thrilled that we are clear of supply constraints and are in full free supply in all geographies. As you can see here, our ability to supply the market has created some unusual sales patterns. This last Q4 was our biggest in PlayStation history in terms of hardware units sold through to consumers. There is pent up demand for PS5 that we need to satisfy, and we look forward to strong months ahead particularly in the upcoming Q3. The worldwide gaming category continues to grow, as does the console market, which is made up of hardware, software, and subscription services. As you will see in the coming slides, we aim to expand our share of the traditional console sector, and then Herman will talk more about how PlayStation Studios will expand content production into PC and mobile to attract even more players. Our ability to expand in these ways will be heavily reliant on the strength of the PlayStation brand. PlayStation is a brand that is respected by gamers across the world. You can see here how, within the console category, we maintain a healthy lead against competitive brands. Content is key to the health of our brand. Across both first and third party games, PS5 has seen the strongest releases of any generation. But we are still just getting started. As studios across the world get even better at taking advantage of the capabilities of PS5, we are looking forward to delivering some of the best games the world has ever seen. This great content is translating into high levels of consumer engagement. As you can see here, 
PS5 owners are playing more than PS4 gamers did at the same point in their respective life cycles. They are more likely to be playing games, playing more often, and utilizing our store and PlayStation Plus at a higher rate. This engagement is translating into a higher user spend than we have ever seen before. From subscriptions to add-on spend to purchasing additional accessories, PS5 is driving significantly higher spend than any other generation. As we move into free supply, we expect PS5 to surpass PS4 on every user KPI, including monthly active users, spend, and gameplay hours within this current fiscal year. Very soon, the more highly engaged and higher spending PS5 players will constitute the majority of our player base by every measure. Just under a year ago, we relaunched our highly successful PlayStation Plus service to offer players greater value. Our ambition was to improve retention and increase ARPU and profitability. The new tiers offer greater access to catalog gaming content, classic titles, and streaming. We are delighted with how consumers have embraced the new offering. As you can see here, the new offering has driven hundreds of millions of hours of gaming and made PlayStation Plus much stickier, even as people begin to travel and engage in other forms of in-person entertainment. ARPU continues to rise, and new content is being added all the time, ensuring there is something for everyone and always something new to play. Our new PlayStation Plus service has seen great reception among subscribers, with 30% of our consumers choosing the new extra and premium tiers in just 10 months. In addition to the strong reception, we are seeing that players have a greater preference for our premium tier, with more than half of higher tier users opting for the best experience PlayStation Plus has to offer. An area of our business that is also booming is accessories. Our PS5 peripheral line is the best we've ever released for any console, both in functionality and aesthetics. As you can see from the chart on the right, the growing consumer demand for PS5 accessories is driving record high revenue in this highly important and profitable category. And that brings me to the topic of VR. This year, we successfully launched our new generation of virtual reality gaming, allowing our players to escape into new worlds with high fidelity visuals and unique sensations. We launched dozens of games and there are plenty more experiences to come this year and beyond. I'm delighted to say PlayStation VR 2 is having a great reception and early sell through is performing above the previous VR generation. While VR is still a nascent part of the overall gaming category, we are proud to be pushing innovation in this space. I'd now like to hand over to Herman to talk about our content strategies. Thanks, Eric. I'm Herman Hulst, head of PlayStation Studios. This is a very exciting time for first-party content from both PlayStation Studios and Bungie. Together, we are undertaking significant investment in our portfolio to underpin future growth for SIE. And this includes how we maximize opportunities with our existing IP, how we build new franchises, and how we expand our reach to audiences on different platforms, including through successful life service experiences. Our partnership with Bungie is an outstanding example of SIE's advances in life services. Bungie's one of the leading developers and publishers of life service games in the world today, and we are fully engaged in applying their expertise and experience as we advance our planning for life service delivery, not only within PlayStation Studios, but across the SIE publishing divisions as well. In the same way, we believe that SIE's capabilities and expertise can help Bungie fulfill their dream of being one of the world's leading entertainment companies. The success of Destiny 2 Lightfall, exceeding Bungie's own original targets, has been a rewarding test of our collaborative approach. New IP has always been the lifeblood of entertainment, and SIE continues to significantly increase our investment in this area. From less than a quarter of PlayStation Studios' total spent in fiscal year 19, we will see investment in new IP rise to 50% of a much larger total by fiscal year 25. This is investment that we anticipate will yield significant returns in the second half of this decade. The strength of our existing IP portfolio, together with our major investment plans, is increasing our appetite and ability to extend properties beyond gaming making them accessible and loved by even wider audiences. 
We are bringing PlayStation franchises to movies and TV, as well as parallel opportunities with experiential events such as theme park attractions and extensive merchandise agreements. The final area of portfolio expansion is in live services. As you can see on the left-hand side, considerable gaming category growth is anticipated to be driven by live service titles and content. On the right-hand side, you can see how our investment approach is changing to embrace this, with more than half of PlayStation Studios spent focused on live service by fiscal year 25, all while maintaining our commitment to the single-player narrative experiences that our players love. This will result in a significant rebalancing of our title portfolio. In fiscal year 21, we were effectively managing a single live service franchise, MLB The Show. Following the acquisitions of Bungie, Haven and Firewalk, alongside considerable internal investment and strategic hires, we will see multiple live services releasing as we move forward. In parallel, PlayStation Studios are committed to continuously reviewing our portfolio in relation to the needs of our long-term strategy and to ensuring that development costs are controlled and sustainable as we build a diverse and profitable portfolio of games. PC has grown to become a substantial part of SIE's first-party business, extending the reach of our IP beyond the console to a broader audience of players. In fiscal year 22, with the very significant contribution of Bungie's established PC business, we more than tripled our revenue from PC players and entered the top 20 publishers on a leading PC game store. We also launched two of our largest PlayStation games on PC, with Spider-Man Remastered in August and The Last of Us Part 1 in March. Our strategy for mobile has seen much activity behind the scenes in the last year, and this is now taking shape. There are three pillars to this. Collaboration on establishing some of our top IP with select industry leaders in the mobile space, establishing our own network of internal development expertise, and finally, building a world-class publishing team with the necessary toolset to deliver successful mobile content. In total, the audience broadening initiatives that you just heard about will have a fundamental effect on the shape of our game portfolio. By fiscal year 25, almost half of our new release lineup will be available on PC and mobile. This is a dramatic change from anything that SAE has done in the past. In summary, we now have a clear and structured approach to SAE's first party portfolio built upon the strong foundations of a wide variety of genres and business models across both new and established IP with a cadence of two or more major releases a year. We have established the capability to grow our franchises and to maximize key IP across different platforms alongside significant new revenue and media opportunities. Thank you for your time. I will now pass over to Lynn. Thank you, Herman. I'm Lynn Tao, Senior Vice President of Finance, Corporate Strategy and Development. You've heard from Herman and Eric about how we think about sustaining the momentum of our core business. We're very confident that we can grow our business by expanding our PlayStation 5 install base, providing a world-class commerce experience, and evolving ourselves into IP powerhouse. We remain committed to growing our business by deepening audience engagement and broadening the player base. We can grow our console business by continuing to strengthen our proposition we're offering to our players. At the same time, we see huge opportunities to expand our player base beyond console and into PC and mobile spaces, with cross-platform enabled live service being at the very core. The acquisition and investment we made over the past years are playing key roles in our growth strategy. It is important to stress that while we're remaining committed to achieve growth, we will focus more on cost saving and profit generation during the coming years. Improving the level of return of investment will be our priority. The final section of this presentation deals with the importance of Sony Group collaboration and the work we are proudly doing across the key areas of environmental, social, and governance. Sony Group collaboration continues to be a competitive advantage for us. We continue impacting culture with cross-promotional and integration opportunities by leveraging talent and branded content creation. 
The sales and marketing team continue to cross-promote hardware and other priorities. And one of the most exciting areas for collaboration is the further amplification of our powerhouse IP. This was best exemplified by The Last of Us HBO TV series, which had record-breaking viewership and a hugely positive impact on game sales. Lastly, we will continue to leverage the reach of PlayStation to promote Sony Group priorities. Another key area where we are collaborating closely with the Sony Group is in ESG. We couldn't be prouder of the progress that SIE is making across all of the initiatives shown here, particularly in the area of accessibility, sustainability, and diversity. Thank you for your attention. I hope that we have shown you our threefold strategy for growth, a healthy and growing player base, an aggressive approach to portfolio growth, and increasing collaboration with the Sony Group to push our IP harder than ever before. Thank you for listening. I look forward to the Q&A that we will now begin. Now, we'd like to take questions from investor and analyst. The responder will be from Sony Interactive Entertainment President and CEO, Jim Lyon, SVP, Global Marketing, Sales and Business Operation, Eric Lempo, the head of the PlayStation Studio, Herman Hust, and SVP, Finance, Corporate Development, and strategy, Lin Tao. Those four people will answer to the questions. Now, we will like to move on to the Q&A session. Please limit your questions to two questions per person. If you have questions, then please press star on the phone as well as one. Now, the first person to ask questions, that is going to be English, as I was some uh, from Citigroup Security. Yes, hi, it's Koto Zaha from Citigroup. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, thank you for taking my question. I have two questions for you. Um, the first question is, on, um, given that the PS5 is attra attracting deeper to consumers, making them pay more money than PS4, in the subscriptions or lifetime value, as you mentioned in the presentation deck. Um, can you give us some of, some of your thoughts on potential price hike on the PlayStation Plus service um, um, and then a potential path to increase lifetime value above, um, I guess you have the $622 at this point? This is my first question. Uh, do you want me to answer the first one now before you ask the second one, or do you want to give them both together? Yes. Yeah. Let me uh, ask the second question as well. Um, okay. The question on the non-game category in SIE is the second question. Um, and then the future profit, um, the breaking boundary increasing beyond just the gaming business at SIE. Um, assuming SIE is diversifying IP uh, exploitation in a movie and TV and a theme park, etc., um, also into PC and a mobile game, um, do you think those new business categories uh, that can make a higher profit margin than the traditional game title and add-on sales in the game? I'm guessing you have more partners in those new areas and sharing profit, making profit, making your profit a bit more diluted. Um, the ultimate question is that the business segment, SIE's business segment, can make, say, more than $5 billion profit in the long-term future as, a, as an, uh, uh, the growth trend. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you for the questions. Uh, the, the, the first one on, on PlayStation Plus, um, we are constantly... Um, looking at the pricing of our products and services 
um, whether it's in the in the context of competition, whether it's in the context of the macroeconomic um, situation, or whether it's in the context of the uh, of the value that we believe that those products and services provide, then you will um, you will probably be aware that we took the step uh, last year of increasing the price um, of the PlayStation 5 console um, in every market outside of the U.S. as the first time. Uh, that uh, any platform holder has taken that that step in the history of this industry. Um, so we we are prepared to take um, these steps where where we feel um, that they are justified and necessary. Um, and we we constantly um, are reviewing the prices um, of uh, of our hardware, of our games, and of our services. And that will include PlayStation Plus. Um, nothing specific to announce today, um, but. Um, as you as you saw in the presentation um, fr from Eric, we are we are very focused on this question of maximizing and optimizing lifetime value, um, and and price uh, as well as engagement is a key component of that. Um, so that's the answer to the first uh, of your two questions. Um, in the the context, the, the second question, um, we we as as you've noted um, have. Uh, a, a very um, deliberate and clear strategy um, of diversifying the exploitation of, of our IP um, away from the console space um, into other forms of gaming, uh, PC and mobile, um, as well as uh, a number um, of, of non-game related initiatives. Um, we believe um, that over time um, that these um, may become um, significant generators of profit to us. Uh, in fact, already um, our PC business um, is a significant profit contributor. Um, the, the, I would say, however, that the, uh, right now that the principal, um, the principal reason uh, for this diversification um, of IP exploitation um, is really to increase the reach um, and, um, and, and growth um, of this IP um, and just to expose it to more people. Uh, and we, we had a really um, a great case study of that with the, um, uh, with the, the HBO series, The Last of Us. Um, uh, and, and, and we could see very, very clearly that every time um, an episode uh, of that show dropped, that sales of the game um, increased very dramatically. There was a spike um, a really quite remarkable spike uh, and, and an overall upward trend. Uh, but each time, um, each time, each each day of the week that one of these episodes dropped, um, we sold a lot more games. Um, so I see this whole thing as being symbiotic. Uh, I don't see it really as been binary. I think um, I think as we expand the reach of the IP, um, that that the, the the whole of our ecosystem, whether it's game, uh, PC, mobile. Uh, or the non-game space, um, the, the opportunity for the whole of the um, SIE pie to grow uh, becomes very considerable. Um, thank you for your question. Thank you. I'm not hearing anything. I don't know whether the next question is coming. Uh, Mr. Klusa, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Hello? Klusa, do you hear me? And because of the line, uh, the condition, and would like to move on to the next uh, speak question. And the question in Japanese, uh, Ayada-san of JP Morgan. Uh, hi, thanks for taking my question, Junior Ayada from JP Morgan. Uh, I have two questions, please. The first one is on uh, live service gaming. Uh, could you just remind us what you have done, you have learned from the Bungie software regarding especially game development? And uh, how you have seen the progress of the, the game, develop, game development in Sony Studio, and also how are you confident to increase first first party sales to increase by double in 2025? That first question. 
And the second question is on uh, slide 27. Uh, I think you have shown that uh, almost half of release will be coming from the PlayStation, uh, non-PlayStation, I mean the PC and mobile in 2025. And is this also meaning that half of the revenue is coming from the PC and mobile platform, or is this just around the number of the release title? Thank you. Yes, um, thank you, Ayada-san. Um, I will um, I'll quickly answer the, uh, the question about the uh, doubling the first party revenues by FY25. The answer to that question is yes. Um, I, um, I'll then, uh, I, I would say um, that we have been working now with Bungie um, for almost a year, um, and the, the learnings in both directions um, have been very significant. Um, they surpass uh, my expectations, and I think Bungie um, is equally uh, extremely excited by um, what they can take uh, from SIE in terms of market reach, uh, marketing, um, collaboration, um, and the ability to amplify their IP. Um, I'll ask Herman um, to just, uh, as, as um, the head of PlayStation Studios, just to um, give give some colour at a studio level about the learnings that we have taken from um, Bungie in in our own live service uh, initiative. Yes, thank you, Jim. Um, the learnings from from Bungie have been very substantial in in many many areas. Um, of course, when uh, you're developing live service titles, you have uh, capabilities that you don't have when you're working on single-player narrative-driven um, uh, games. And these capabilities um, that we've set up inside PlayStation Studios have been helped, they've been guided by Bungie. We also more deeply understand what means, uh, what success means in live services. Uh, historically, uh, our games always work towards an end, and this is a, a large cultural shift. Um, the launch of a game is just the beginning, and that comes with a whole set of different KPIs. Um, we also work with Bungie on a pretty rigorous, uh, rigorous portfolio review process that we apply to all 12 live service titles that we have in production. And, and these are just three examples of, of some of the learnings uh, that we that we have gained from working with Bungie. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Herman. Uh, I'll take the uh, the, the second leg, uh, Ayada-san. Um, slide 27 refers to the number of titles, um, and it does, does not uh, refer to, uh, to revenue in this instance, although um, obviously there is some correlation. Uh, but we would foresee that uh, in that time frame that the great majority of the revenue would come from console and, and PC. So thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. Move on to the next question, and that is going to be in English. From the Morgan Standard, MEP EG, and Ono Sam, please. Hi, thank you very much for uh, taking my questions. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first question. Um, based on the current MAU, um, so one, around 110 million, and the cumulative unit sales, uh, we believe uh, there is still more than uh, around 70 million of potential demand uh, for PS5 going forward. What is your conviction regarding the further penetration of a PS5 uh, from management uh, perspective? And uh, is there any uh, obstacle to uh, combating uh, all 70 million units to PS5, or uh, do you expect to exceed uh, the incremental 70 million? And the second question uh, is, um, looking at the cycle of the PlayStation platform in the past, uh, typically uh, the fourth year after launch uh, was the peak of hardware sales, and the fifth year was the uh, peak of software. Um, since PS5 was launched in uh, November 2020, uh, do you expect the uh, hardware peak year to come around uh, fiscal uh, March 24 to uh, March 25? Uh, that is uh, my question. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, just a, a point of clarification on your first question. Um, are you asking if we anticipate um, 
sales of, or if we feel that sales of additional 70 million PS5s on top of what we've already achieved, uh, if that is possible? Is, was that your question? Uh, yes, uh, that's correct. Uh, because um, our penetration unit, um, uh, regarding the penetra penetration unit, is uh, still less than uh, 40 million. But the MAEU is uh, 110 million. Um, so that's why um, any additional demand, uh, what is your view? Uh, that is what uh, I want to know. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so I, I, would, um, I would anticipate uh, that over the life of the PlayStation 5, um, that we should, uh, we should be able to exceed um, a figure of a, a further 70 million on top of the 38 million that Eric um, mentioned in his, in, in his section of the presentation. Um, and the reason I say that is that um, the, the, I think the 70 million that you mentioned is the, um, is the existing PlayStation um, 4 uh, user base. And while we, we would hope to uh, convert a large number of those people, um, we will definitely um, we will definitely target and we will definitely be successful uh, in bringing in um, large numbers of gamers who who did not own a PlayStation 4 and in many instances um, have never owned any PlayStation. Um, so I, I would um, I, I, I am very optimistic uh, that over the life of this platform that we will exceed the number that you mentioned. Um, I, I think the um, and and. So turning now to your second question, um, and, and yes, the, um, the numbers that you co quote with regard to, um, to, to history um, are certainly accurate. Um, I think, uh, and, and, and I think we would anticipate um, something broadly similar um, happening on this cycle. Um, I would say uh, that this cycle is a little bit different in that the demand for PlayStation 5 um, exceeds by such a great margin uh, the demand that we've ever seen um, on any of our other platforms. Um, and, and that, um, together with the, um, the well-documented um, supply chain challenges that, that we, along with um, many other consumer goods companies, have experienced over the, uh, the course of the pandemic, um, have meant that there's a, a great deal of pent-up demand um, for, for our hardware that, that has never existed in the past. Um, and so you, you, may see, you may see the trend's been a little bit different this time, but I think that directionally um, you're correct. Um, the, the other observation I'd offer on the software side of the business um, is that in this cycle um, you will see live services and free-to-play games um, playing a far greater role than they have um, in any historic cycle. Um, and again, um, that may well uh, provide a slightly distorting effect um, and, and is likely to result um, in a persistently high level um, of, of software engagement and software sales, uh, perhaps than we've ever seen in the past. Um, so uh, thank you for your questions. And we'd like to move on to the next question. Uh, TD Cohen, uh, Claude Sam, and uh, would you please try once again for your question? Can you hear me this time? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Uh, first question, there's been a lot of attention for various reasons paid to uh, the cloud gaming market recently. I'm curious in your view about how important mobility of your players' gaming experiences for games that they own uh, is going to be, uh, you know, presumably using the cloud. And, and what, what's your plan to enable that over, let's say, the next five years? Second question, you talked about what you're learning from Bungie earlier. I'm kind of curious in the other direction. I know before you acquired them, they were putting together some plans to, to bring their IP uh, to other media and, and wondered whether you've been able to accelerate that process for them, uh, given all your expertise in that area. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I, I think, um, the, uh, you, you know, yes, you're, you're right, there has been a lot of attention uh, around the area of cloud gaming. Um, and um, we, we, we observe mobility um, in, in, in gaming habits to be an, increasing, um, an increasingly important trend. 
um, and and the cloud will be um, will be fundamental um, to um, a, a allowing us or indeed anybody else to uh, exploit that that trend of mobility. Um, and um, we have and and unfortunately today is not the uh, is not the place for me to uh, disclose these plans. But we do have um, some some uh, fairly um, interesting and, and quite aggressive plans to accelerate um, our initiatives uh, in the space of the cloud that, that will unfold uh, over the course of the coming months. Um, the, I, I, the, so that's the first question. Um, the second question I touched on a bit uh, in, in, in one of the earlier questions. Um, I think um, we have um, we've brought quite a lot to Bungie, just as, as they've uh, certainly brought qu quite a lot to us. Um, they uh, historically have been um, a, a heavily um, US-focused publisher um, with, with really um, their IP rather under, under exploited uh, in the key markets of, uh, of Europe and Asia. Um, now, SIE is extremely strong and extremely um, seasoned and a, a extremely experienced uh, in Europe and Asia. Um, and, and we are just starting the um, starting the process um, of of really igniting uh, Bungie's presence and Bungie's uh, game awareness uh, in those regions. Um, I'd also say, uh, uh, and and Eric uh, and his team are um, already uh, highly active in this place. Um, we have uh, a marketing machine that, um, in my in my view, is world class. Um, and uh, setting them to work uh, on uh, activating Bungie's, Bungie's games um, um, and Bungie's IP uh, and Bungie's own brand, um, I think is going to take their um, is is going to take their um, awareness uh, and and the size of their business to levels that they've never seen before. Um, and and certainly non-media. Um, those discussions are already starting. Uh, they're already taking place internally, um, and that's an area that we uh, we consider to be very important. Uh, thank you for your question. We don't have much time left, so next person is going to be the last question, and that's going to be in English. And from Ministry for Security, is in a please. Hi, uh, thanks for a great presentation. Thanks. Um, my name is Nakane from Yuho. I got two questions, on, on mainly on financial side. And firstly, on Bungie, I remember that um, uh, you're targeting to launch three titles before to March to 25. And then uh, I guess that uh, maybe break even or kind of starting to have a kind of significant earnings contribution from March to 26. Uh, is this that still uh, still right? And then if any change, then please let us let me know if any kind of uh, plans on the financial side, on PL side, on Bungie, the first one. And second one is uh, kind of financial discipline uh, into next midterm plan. Uh, I believe there are so many uh, M&A or investment opportunity for SIE, and then I, I believe you can get a kind of big harvest after investment. But I wonder, uh, as an analyst, uh, how to uh, model in, in uh, SIE's earnings uh, in next midterm plan. So if you give uh, me any kind of clues uh, for kind of uh, ROIC target or kind of sustainable ROIC target level, OP cash flow, or uh, your way to think about uh, next midterm plan on revenue OP, uh, namely, uh, uh, can we expect um, kind of st steady growth of uh, OP or ABTA, even uh, doing kind of massive investment, or the next three years we should be kind of staying flat or very kind of gradual growth or revenue uh, for the profit because of huge investment? This is my question. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Nakane-san. Um, I will offer some comments and then I'll invite Lin Tao. Um, as, as the head of finance to, um, uh, to, to add her thoughts. Um, the, the, um, the Bungie uh, release schedule 
um, I think is is basically on track. You, you know, titles move around a little bit um, in in any um, development and publishing organisation. Um, the um, but you, you know we're confident in the plans that that Bungie has to to release new games. Um, Lynn, could you comment um, on the particular point about the the the, the earnings, please? Uh, sure, uh, Jim. Uh, Nakane-san, thank you for the question. Uh, we think it's important to look at our ROIC level uh, over the entire um, uh, life cycle. The ROIC tends to be lower at the beginning of the life cycle and then improve over the time towards the end of life cycle. Um, we believe that we're hitting the lowest point in this fiscal year, and you will see an uh, uplifting from next fiscal year. The key drivers from revenue side is um, the increasing of highly engaged PS5 users base and new revenue stream from the launch of the live service games that are currently in our pipelines. Um, on the invested capital side, towards the later stage of the console life cycle, you will see the decrease in PS5 inventory, which will um, contribute to the um, positive ROIC. In terms of the earning expectation, um, again, um, we see we had a pretty challenging fiscal year 22, um, but um, we are looking at uh, uplift on the earning uh, generation level in the coming uh, several years. And um, it's also contributed by the highly engaged PS5 user base and live service games that are currently under development. Back to you, John. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Lynn. Uh, yeah, I, I just to build on that, you know, FY, our absolute level of profitability was decent in FY22, but we did struggle. Uh, we did struggle with uh, a highly adverse exchange rate environment. We struggled with the supply chain difficulties, and we struggled with um, a post-COVID kind of rebound with everybody uh, going out and traveling and perhaps not spending as much time gaming as they used to. Um, all of those three things. Um, are now reversing either partially or fully, um, and 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 I, um, you, you, you know, typically we we historically we would characterise uh, the next two to three years as as the harvest period um, in terms of profit and cash flow for our business, um, and and we 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 see that um, together with the fact that the pipeline um, of the games made by the companies that we've acquired uh, so aggressively over the course of the past uh, couple of years, um, we we feel very bullish um, about about the profit structure, um, just as as Lynn has outlined um, over the course of uh, the next two to three years uh, for Sony Interactive Entertainment. Uh, so thank you for the question. Thank you. And it's time to close, so Game and Network Service session is going to be closed. Thank you very much for your attendance. And the next will be Sonia.